The subject before us is one that we're very familiar with, except that man thinks that he will bring world peace, but God says that he will bring world peace. So there's a contention. But one thing should be very plain in this, uh, in this world, ladies and gentlemen, because this statement was made thousands of years ago, at least 4,000 years ago, that the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. And yet what do we find? The world is ignorant of it. But why should they not be ignorant? Because Almighty God, through his Bible, has told us this clearly, if we will but hear it. You see, the philosophers of this world teach us that there is no God, or at best that God is dead, and that the Bible is just a book of myth and poetry or prose and fanciful stories. But the Bible clearly teaches otherwise. And the challenge is, are we wise enough to read it and to understand it? In Numbers 14 and verse 21, the Bible has clearly defined to us that truly I live, almighty God does live, and all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. So almighty God has certified to us that he does live, and that as certain as the fact of his existence, God will fill this earth with his glory. The prophet Habakkuk added to that sure purpose in Habakkuk 2 and verse 14, where he declared, For the earth shall be filled not just with the glory of the Lord, but with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Of the Lord. And so whereas we have this day, few people know of Almighty God. The time is coming when as the waters cover the sea, people everywhere are going to have a knowledge of the glory, the moral glory of Almighty God. So the, the knowledge of the glory of God will fill this earth. This world is going to change. The Apostle Paul extends this idea in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 2, he says, to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So he's talking to those who do accept that there is a God. And so they accept the things that Almighty God says. And as we find in chapter 2 and verse 1, they were dead in trespasses and sins. So they were in the world without hope as the vast majority of people are. But in verse 10, through the Apostle Paul, he directs these words to the faithful. And he says, we are his workmanship. We are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, Almighty God is working in this world at this very time with those who are prepared to walk with him. The world does not have an excuse for lack of peace, as we shall find. Okay, so let's consider the background to these things. For 6,000 years ago, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, we find that the earth was without form and void. It was basically like, basically like a big shovel full of gravel floating around in space at an appropriate place for this earth to be formed by the work of Almighty God. Man at this point did not exist. He had zero knowledge. He had zero wisdom. He had zero understanding. He had zero existence, except 
in the mind of Almighty God. And we know that in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1, which is an example of what happened on each day of creation, that God said, let there be light, and there was light. So a commandment went forth from Almighty God that there should be light, and light was created, was made manifest in this case. Now that word God there is an interesting one because it is the Hebrew word Elohim. It's actually plural. And it's speaking of those who manifested the qualities of Almighty God as his servants to do his will at this time. And we want to look at this. So how did God do this for each day of creation? Well, in short, these Elohim or God are mighty ones who manifest the glory of God. In Psalms 103 and 104, 103 verse 20 and 21, the psalmist directs his thoughts to the army of Almighty God, his public servants. The psalmist says, bless the Lord ye his angels. And those angels are otherwise translated as messengers that excel in strength. Of course, to do the work of creation, they had to excel in strength, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, power, might, all those things which belong to Almighty God. That do his commandments Hearkening to the voice of his word. Now let's go back. God said, let there be light. And there was light. That is precisely what we're reading here. His angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, let there be light. Hearkening unto the voice of his word. And in verse 21, again. Okay. Again, the psalmist says, bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts. And those hosts are the army of Almighty God. Ye ministers of his, and those ministers are his public servants who do his pleasure. They do his will. And so here we are, have, have depicted for us another aspect of that creation work that it was performed by a glorious host of angels, the armies of Almighty God, who were his public servants to do his pleasure. And then in Psalm 104 and verses 4 and 5 we read that Almighty God makes his angels spirits. And notice here that it's talking about messengers again, angels, but the ones that belong to Almighty God. There are other messengers in the Bible which don't have to be immortal servants of Almighty God. These are his ministers manifesting themselves as a flaming fire. And what does it say in verse 5? That they laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. And so that's how Almighty God has performed this work. But how did Almighty God come to be there in the first place? Well, the scriptures are very plain again. Because Almighty God is from everlasting to everlasting. In Psalm 90 and verse 2, God already existed before the mountains were brought forth. In creation. Or ever the, thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. He has no beginning and no end. It's unfathomable in our finite thinking. In 1 Timothy 1 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul shows us that God was immortal. The only supreme being with wisdom, in fact. In fact, the only supreme being, full stop. 
And he says in, the, in verse 17 of 1 Timothy 1, he says, Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Now isn't such a being going to be quite capable of doing that work? And in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15 and 16, we find that he is the fountain of immortality which in his times Christ shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, supreme power, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality. Now take each of those things. Take each of those, a potentate. How many people do we have on the face of the earth at this very moment who want to be exactly that? And we all know who they are. Their names are in the papers, in the news all the time. They want to control this earth. And the events we've seen in the last few days with the Taliban, there's a group of people that totally want to change this earth. <clears throat> but God dwells in light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honour and power everlasting. So be it, was the words of the Apostle Paul. And so we're learning something about Almighty God for a reason. Because at creation, God, or the Elohim, the angels of God, delivered man a project to complete. In effect, they said to Adam, we want you to become a project manager. You've got a little project to do. And that was discussed amongst the angels at the creation of man. In verse 26 of Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Now, that's the first thing that man was, to, was told that he has to, had to do was have dominion, but over what? Over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image, in the image of God created in him, male and female created him, that's a problem these days, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over those things. And you know what? He still hasn't succeeded. To that challenge, uh, to that project was added a challenge. Because in chapter 2 and verses 15 to 17, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it. This is your project. This is your place of employment. This is what you are uh, about from now on. But then the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of this garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now this accentuates the difference between man and the animal crea the, the other rest of the animal creation. Because this required that man be a moral individual. That each man and woman be a moral individual. And how can you be a moral individual? by upholding righteousness. And where does that come from? It only comes from Almighty God. And we're going to see that, God willing. And so man's challenge was to be moral. He was to seek the righteousness of God, not follow his own instincts. And so in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, man was put under that test. 
And in Genesis chapter 3, and I'm sure we're all familiar with it, he failed that test. He became death stricken, prone to sin and subject to the curses which were enumerated. And bless him, he passed those physical characteristics on to us so that we are under that same regime. Now this failure led to a state of, of enmity that continues today. And in Romans chapter 8 and verses 5, and we're going to pick up verse 7, the Apostle Paul said, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So there are two ways that man can go. He can follow the thinking of the flesh or he can follow the thinking of the spirit, the thinking of Almighty God. And that's basically contained in this book. But then he says in verse 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God. And our subject is peace. But enmity against God is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And so in this crisis, Almighty God set out a plan for the redemption of man for this dilemma, from this dilemma that would bring about his redemption and build a people fit for eternal inheritance. We're going to look at that in a moment. But look at the problem that we have. There's the mind of the flesh and there's the mind of the spirit. Man has a choice. But if he chooses the mind of the flesh, that mind is at enmity with Almighty God. Can there be peace? Can there be peace while people have a carnal mind that is at enmity with God? In fact, you would almost be thinking already that that would be about the stupidest thing you could ever do. Because who's going to pick a fight with Almighty God and win? But the world sees it not. So we have a crisis and a plan of redemption was needed. And so we're going backwards now to Genesis 3 and verse 15. Because this plan of redemption is revealed to us in Genesis 3 and verse 15. But let's read it and see what it says. He says, I will put enmity because of the sin of Adam and Eve. Almighty God said, I will put enmity between thee, the serpent he's talking to, and the woman, Eve, and between your seed, the serpent's seed, and her seed, the seed of the woman, principally the Lord Jesus Christ and those in Christ. It shall bruise thy head, so the serpent would be bruised on the head by the seed of the woman, the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt bruise his heel. Speaking to us of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, which would be a factor in this plan of redemption. And so effectively, this plan of redemption says that there is enmity created by the sin that occurred, but there's a plan of redemption that the serpent would be uh, dealt a death blow to the head, but the seed of the woman, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be struck on the heel, bitten on the heel. And we know that he was hung on the cross, that he died and was raised again. Now this enmity that we see here is relevant to our subject. 
Because this enmity, as we have seen from Romans chapter 8, separates these two fractions. The serpent and the seed of the serpent, those that follow the way of the serpent, they are the godless. They don't regard Almighty God. They don't choose to walk in knowledge and understanding and faith in the things of Almighty God. And the woman and the seed of the woman. The Lord Jesus Christ and the godly, those prepared to follow in faith the ways of Almighty God as they are in Christ. Now man was also put under a curse. And we're just going to read part of it because you only need to read part of it to know what's happened in regard to this subject. You see, he was told to have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, etc. Over the natural, over the nature around us, if you like. The world of nature, the plants and animals about us. And what was he told? Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shall they eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Dying thou, he was going to die. But in everything that he did, there would be a curse upon it. And you know, this is quite incredible. I spent 40 years in the plant breeding industry. And the whole thing about the plant breeding industry is trying to keep one step ahead of this curse. Because as fast as you overcome the rusts and the other diseases, the stack of diseases that attack wheat plants, the curse catches up with you. And the last time, a few weeks ago, that I looked up those things, I read that there's a new strain of rust that they don't have an answer to. And so the curse is continually catching up with man. The COVID is simply a factor of the curse. And what's man trying to do? He's trying to dominate that curse. And where's he going? As fast as he catches up, it gets ahead of him. And so it will, because that's the nature of the curse. And so man's ability to have that dominion, he was told to go and, and take hold of, has been, the ability of him to take hold of that has been destroyed by the entrance of sin into, in, into the world and the curse that came upon him. So man's contract to have dominion over nature is now cursed. He failed to harness his nature, a prerequisite to dominion, and he has never had full dominion as required of him. Now in Exodus 34, we read something of the character of Almighty God. It's really revealing to us the morality of Almighty God. In verse 6 and 7, the Lord passed before Moses, this was, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. And this is the character of Almighty God. This is his morality. Is that morality being manifested in Afghanistan today? Of course it's not. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but that will by no means clear the guilty. See, it's justice in the mercy of Almighty God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children under the third and fourth generation. But this morality of Almighty God is based on another fundamental of God, and that is his righteousness. Let's consider that. We've got three or four quotes here from the Old Testament. There are many others. In Psalm, Psalm 11 and verse 7, 
We read that for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. It's an integral part of his character. His countenance doth behold the upright, like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. It's never going to go away, the righteousness of Almighty God. And thy law, because of thy righteousness, Almighty God, is truth. In Jeremiah 23 and verse 6 we read, The Lord our righteousness. And when you look at what the Taliban is doing and what America's doing and the, all these other nations, it just in that little spot of Afghanistan, they're all trying to assert their righteousness. But they're forgetting about the righteousness of Almighty God. And when we forget about the righteousness of Almighty God, when we don't take hold of the righteousness of Almighty God and throw ours out the back window, then we're in trouble like that world. In Jeremiah 33 and verse 16, speaking of the future of Jerusalem, he said, I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and Judah, under the promises made to David, King David, which is another subject I'm not going to enter there. In verse 15, he said, I cause the... I will cause the branch of righteousness, and that's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. Because the Lord Jesus Christ was like that with his father. I and my father are one, and he's meant in heart, mind, understanding, and wisdom, knowledge. They were at one. And he goes on and he says, In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely, such as it doesn't today. And this is the name whereby they shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. So in the future, Jerusalem is going to be a city of peace because it's going to be filled with the righteousness of Almighty God. If we go to the New Testament, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us, his policy speech for the kingdom of God this is, and this is one aspect of it. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is one of the major aspects of the gospel message. The gospel message is the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And here he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not our own. Seek God's righteousness as a first priority in life. And most people in this world don't have a blue clue what it is. Little wonder the world is in the mess it is. In Romans 1 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul says concerning this same gospel message, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith to develop our understanding and our faith in the things of Almighty God that we might be at one with him, that our reasoning might see the wisdom of the way of Almighty God. Not that we become robots, nothing like that at all, the absolute opposite. In Romans 10 and verse 3 he said, concerning some that don't don't follow that way, he says, for they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness. Surely that's what we've seen in the last couple of weeks in Afghanistan. A group of people going about to absolutely establish their own righteousness. And the ones that have been before haven't really been any different because the world is so full of it. 
They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And Philippians 3 and verse 9, on a similar note, people not having their own righteousness, but which is, but that, oh, sorry, <clears throat> speaking of the faithful, in fact, those that do not have their own righteousness, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And so that's what we need to have. We need to throw our righteousness away because it's going to be wrong and establish ourselves in the righteousness, the moral equity, if you like, of Almighty God. Now, man's had 6,000 years to achieve this, but he continues to fail. Even Israel constituted the kingdom of God upon the earth with a priesthood and a divinely given law failed. And nations continue to fail today. Now just look at this. It's actually talking about ancient Israel. I guess two and a half thousand years ago thereabouts. Okay, so it's talking about that time. But see if it doesn't apply today. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away back, and justice standeth afar off. Wow, we see that all the time, don't we? For truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. What a street to live in. Will we all live in that street today? Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And that's precisely what is happening. Precisely what is happening. And we hear of stories of faithful men and women being put to the test whether they would change their heart and mind. And if they don't, they were shot. You see, that event took place two and a half thousand years ago. And the factors surrounding it are different today. But the principle applies. Is it relevant? Of course it's relevant. So that lesson applies to us today also. But let's read verse 15. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departs from evil makes himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw there was no man, no man, not Putin, not Trump, not the new leader in America, not Johnson in Britain, not Ned Nahu or his successor. None of them. There is no man and there wasn't back then. There was no intercessor capable of doing the job properly. So what did God do? He made his own, he brought, therefore his arm brought salvation unto him. And his righteousness, it sustained him. You see, this underlines the failure of man and the enmity that denies true peace. You see, it's the delight of human nature to do its own thing, to ignore the things of God. And man has miserably failed to see this issue so plainly set forth. And we all fail in this regard because of the weakness of our nature. But look again at Isaiah 59. The Lord saw that there was no man. He wondered there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation. His righteousness, it sustained him. 
Because in verse 1, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy, he's hearing what happens. He is seeing what happens in this world. You see, this is a prophecy of the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ as Redeemer. Man has not been left without a solution. Let's go back to Romans 8. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded, what is it? It is life and peace. Isn't that what we're looking for? But the carnal mind is enmity against God. That's the problem. That's why we haven't got peace. But it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You see, enmity and peace cannot coexist without a war. <clears throat> in Isaiah 57 that we read this evening, we read in verse 16, I will not contend forever, neither will I be always wroth, Almighty God said. In verse 19 he said, peace, peace, and isn't this what we hear? They cry peace all the time. But what does he say in verse 20? The wicked are like the troubled sea. That's where the enmity is. They are like the troubled sea. When it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt, they are not gaining peace, they are creating mire and dirt upon this earth. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. But our subject is about world peace, isn't it? You might think we're off the subject, we're not. Because man wants peace so that he can have dominion. And that's why he cries out peace all the time. Because he wants that dominion. But he ignores God and his plan for genuine world peace. To take away the enmity. God is telling us, conquer self first if you want true peace. Now Daniel chapter 2 sets forth to us an outline of this world's great empires. And let's look at those great empires. As they relate, th these are depicted as they relate to the Jews and the central purpose of Almighty God. It outlines to us the history, if you like, of certain king, certain. Uh, uh, world empires. But it's not a history lesson. It's about the culture of those nations, but of those empires. Because those cultures still exist today. And therefore, it finally represents to us the world in which we live. It was the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon about 600 years ago sorry, 600 BC. It was interpreted by Daniel, a captive from Judah. It set out the history to come and showed that our days in which this, that in our days this image will figuratively stand up. And what's it going to display? The residual cultures of that, those empires. And what were they? I'm very brief here, but I think this is the crunching line. In Daniel 2 and verse 38, Daniel revealed that Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold depicted in that dream. That was Nebuchadnezzar. And the Babylonian Empire from 605 to 539 BC, what did they do? They worshipped idols. They didn't worship the one true God. After them, in verse 39, another kingdom was to arise, inferior to that one, the Medo-Persian Empire. History tells us that. BC 539 to 331, what did they worship? Almighty God? No. They worshipped idols. They were pagans. And then the same verse, another kingdom of brass, the kingdom of, of um, Alexander the Great, 
which was going to bear rule over all the earth. Then note earth. It talks about the Grecians, 331 to 168 BC. What did they worship? Almighty God? No, they worshipped idols. And then there was a fourth kingdom that would come along. Strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. It's the Greco-Roman Empire. The Greeks subsided. The Romans came along. They were bequeathed the city of Pergamos and came in there into Asia. And so we had the Greco and then the Roman Empire. And what did they worship? They were pagans that worshipped idols. And all the definitions that go to make up this world, immortal souls, demons, devils, hellfire, all these things come from these pagan worshippers. And this became the Western and Eastern Catholic Church. You see, this will never bring peace. Daniel 2, verse 41. This all morphed into the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. A kingdom that shall be divided, we are told. The strength of the iron mixed with miry clay. And so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. They shall mingle themselves, but not cleave one to another. It's really telling us about Europe today, dominated by Russia, Catholicism and democracy. But this will never bring peace. Because it's not in accord with the things of Almighty God. For 2,500 years, it's brought suffering and wars. But today, something very important is happening. Because this image is struggling to its feet, complete with the cultural re residual, residuals of all those empires. So you go into a doctor's surgery, and there's the book. Ah, oh, there we are. The horoscope. The 12 signs of the zodiac. You know, once you've, you've read it, once you've read it, you don't need to even open the book afterwards. They're all the same. But that comes from the head of God. It actually comes from Babylon. And all those empires down through time have, have committed things that have become part of the culture of this world around us today. And it's all at enmity with the spirit. Now there is a solution. In verse 44 of Daniel 2, we read this, that in the days of these kings, the kings that represent those feet, those feet there, feet part of iron and part of clay, the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, it's said of that kingdom, this kingdom shall be divided, the strength of iron mixed with the miry clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken, and it's Europe dominated by Russia, Catholicism and democracy. It's in the days of these kings which we see struggling to come to its fruition today around us that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. These words were, were uh, expounded more really back in, in the earlier verses, in verses 34 and 35 of this chapter 2 of Daniel. When Daniel explained the vision to Nebuchadnezzar, he said, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together. You see, it ends up being one image that stands up on the mountains of Israel. 
as a God-defying image. And the stone is the Lord Jesus Christ who is going to set up that kingdom spoken of in verse 44 that will be established for and, and last forever. And it will break in pieces all, those, all of that image, all of that culture that is God-defying, that is God-opposing, that is at enmity with Almighty God, It'll become like the chaff of the summer threshing floor and the wind is going to carry it away, that no place will be found for it. And the stone that smote the image will become a great mountain and fill the whole earth. You see, the Apostle John tells us why man has failed, why he's failed to have dominion over himself. In John 2, verses 15 to 17, he tells us, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. This world is about us and has been there like it for two and a half thousand years and more. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There's enmity. How can you love God and love this world? There's a barrier between. That barrier is enmity. The two causes are opposed. There's enmity between them. For all that is in the world, what is it? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And everything that happens in this world can be explained in those terms. When they come forth, from the minds of men that is unfettered by the things of Almighty God. Everything that is not of the Father but is of the world goes into those three categories. And what does the, what does the Apostle tell us? The world passes away and the lust thereof. Because when Christ returns, when Daniel 2 verse 44 is fulfilled, those things are going to be put to one side. The things of Almighty God are going to be elevated because but he that doeth the will of God will abide forever. This world will be full of such people. In Acts 2, we read about the Lord Jesus Christ prevailing. He has conquered self and has earned the ability to be the king of this world, to bring true peace, to bring righteousness, the righteousness of Almighty God into this earth. In Acts 2 verse 22, the apostle said on the, on, on the occasion of, of um, the day of Pentecost, you men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, he'd just been put to death and raised again and has now ascended to the right hand of the Father. He says, a man, a man, a man that partook of our nature and overcame it, approved of God among you in your very presence by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him because they were at one in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. And there's the witness to us of those things. Him, the Lord Jesus Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. But what happened in verse 24? God raised him up. Having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. See, here's a fundamental with a difference. Christ was raised up because it was not possible that Almighty God in his righteousness could leave him in the grave. And here's the fundamental ingredient for peace. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, 
because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. The problem that came from the things that happened in the Garden of Eden have been put right in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was sinless. And in this overcame his nature, which is our nature. But God is righteous. And in his righteousness, he raised up his son. And quoting from David in Acts 2 and verse 31, he seeing this before, David seeing it before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption because of the righteousness of God and the sinlessness of this man who had overcome himself. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So he has been anointed king to fulfil Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. You see, he had dominion over self first. We read of this in Mark 7. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, they defile the man. And it's based on Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. The world can't offer true peace. They cry peace. There's no peace, says my God, to the wicked. And those quotes simply support those same principles. But in Isaiah 59 and 60, we read these words at the end of 59 and the beginning of 60. The Redeemer shall come to Zion to fulfil Daniel 2. And this is my covenant with him. My spirit, the word of Almighty God, is upon thee. And my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth. The word of God is at one with the Father. And the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Arise, shine, in verse 1 of chapter 60. For thy light is come. And the glory, the moral glory of the almighty God is risen upon thee. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ must come. That we might have glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men.